And the fallen angels is a good example of a place to start. Number one, it's a subject that causes people to become uncomfortable. It's a subject that people just don't want to discuss. But if they knew that they're living their lives in a model after the fallen, then they would start to listen. If they understood that there's no way they can be in righteousness, living a life that was taught by the fallen, then they would give ear. Because many of us think that evil is ugly, evil is scary, and all this. No, it isn't. Evil is beautiful. And God teaches us that evil is beautiful, doesn't he? In fact, Satan is the person of vanity, and he teaches things that are beautiful concepts and the like. And this is one of his uh, ongoing ways that he is extremely deceitful, because even the Bible says he presents himself as an angel of light. So we know he's not perceived as something dark. We know this. He's perceived as something promising. He's perceived as the one that keeps man's standards. Oh boy, I can really just shuffle the pot here. Because God made us not modeled after vain things, but modeled after his son. And if you really take a look at Christ, and you really take a look at the prophets, and you really take a look at the disciples, they kept saying the same thing over and over again. But you have these other individuals. Let me give you a stark example of something. How many of you know about King Nebuchadnezzar? How many of you know about the Sumerian Kingdom? And these were very organized systems. Do you know what Israel suffered from when they were nation building, becoming a nation? In their own language, it was a lack of directives. And this is what they suffered from. This is why they visited all the nations round about them, because it looked appealing to have absolute control over everything. God didn't want them to have absolute control because he has absolute control. But these other kingdoms around Israel, they practiced control, just like King Nebuchadnezzar, just like King Darius, just like the Sumerian kingdom, just like all the other kingdoms that were in the Bible that were instructed to be wiped out. They exercised control. Thus, if they had control, then guess what? God did not. They wouldn't allow God to have control. Well, it just so happens that we live our lives under the banner of that same mechanism that was used in ancient Babylon. The same thing. It is one of those uh, things that's not so obvious because we do love the Babylonian mindset. I know that sounds strange, but we do. People love to know what they're doing from day to day. People love to know what they're getting from week to week. None of that is faith. For example, people love to know exactly what they're going to make and they do plan their lives around retirement and everything else. God never worked that way. He provides on a daily basis. He does not let you know what you're getting a month from now, but he provides based upon what you need that very day. So God gives us day-to-day -day provision, but all these other kingdoms, they taught people how to plan for yearly provision, retirement, and all these other things. And what has that caused in a true sense? Now you have to clear your mind here. We are system thinkers, not kingdom thinkers. And I say this because all of us have issues about retirement. We have issues about savings accounts. We have issues about this, that, and the other. And all of it is of a Babylonian mindset. This is where everything came from. That is not a kingdom mindset. See, we can't even trust the Lord fully. We can't do that because a lot of people can't reconcile. How do you do that? It's very easy. Right now, you may be thinking, well, how do you live your life like that day to day? That seems kind of foolish. How many people would say, well, if I didn't mention God's principles in this talk and I was I were to tell you, listen, you live your life day to day. Let God handle the future. What would most of you do? You say, well, I can't do that. There's no security in that. What about my children? Isn't that a legitimate point of view? What about the children? What about stability? Now, here's the problem. We have such a worldly kingdom mindset, not the kingdom of God, but the world's system mindset, that we believe that the only way to properly manage things is to model or to mimic somebody else who did it before us, as we believe. To have total control, to look at your bank account about 50 times a day. And in doing so, you're taking total control of your future. Here's how you do it by faith. You ready? It's very simple. Most of you are saying, well, that seems kind of foolish and you can't do that. You can't live in the world like that, right? You have to know what you're making in the future in order to have a future, period. Wrong. You know, you have to make a choice to live by faith or not. Most of you have been okay for the last few years. You really have, which tells me you know something about your own life, which tells me you have your own life and account. I've also seen most of you worried when something came up to threaten your next two weeks. See, for some people, it's an eviction. For some people, it may be something else. But see, generally, we have no problems until something is about to take away our home or something takes away our food. Or
or something takes away our ability to communicate like a telephone or a computer or electricity or something like that, generally we're okay. Which means we can see our provision for the next two weeks. We can see a line and we know internally, okay, we're going to make it generally for the next two weeks. I may not like it, but we're going to make it. I may be lacking things, but we're going to make it. Somehow you have that assurance because you know the condition of your own stuff. Now, if you don't know the condition of your own stuff, you're in direct violation of what Jesus taught us to do, which is to know the condition of your sheep of your flock. That's called general responsibility. To know the condition of all those things the Lord gave you. You have to know its condition, right? Remember, you're children of the king, which means you're always in training to be a king, not a queen, a king. No such thing as a queen. I'm going to get in trouble on that one. How do you know there's no such thing as a queen? Because if you begin to study Hebrew, you'll understand that masculine and feminine have nothing to do with gender and everything to do with the power to reproduce oneself or to carry a seed or to be the seed bearer. That's what male and female is. Has nothing to do with reproduction as we see it here on earth. This is romper room. This is not reality yet. We're in a protected bubble right here called earth. We're working things out, learning things. That's just like all you females up there who say, oh, when I get to heaven, I'm going to have a pretty dress. This no, you're not. You're going to be of a form that's not even associated with male or female. How about that one? So all of you, according to the word of God, you're going to be sons of God. You're not going to have reproductive stuff going on. There'll be no need for it. Some people say, well, you know, I'm going to see my children in heaven. You're going to see all your brothers and sisters. That's what you're going to see. Even the children you have right now are your brothers and your sisters. And soon they're going to be all brothers. They're going to be all entities. And we're going to know each other on a very different level, far more than we, what we know now. Anyway, we can't get in that because I might get complicated tonight. Knowing the condition of things gives us a general sense of security. Would you all agree with that? But what happens when that security is threatened? People get upset. They'll say, you know, my house is threatened to be taken away in the next five months. I don't know what to do. And they're worried to death. Now, it'll be five months away, but today they'll be worried to death. They can't eat. They can't sleep. They can't do anything. Why? Because their vision of security five months in the future is disrupted. And so today they can find no peace. You all know that scenario. You probably know somebody of that scenario, right? You yourselves have been upset over something that was in the future, had nothing to do with you today, but it only threatened your future security and it made you sick. Do you remember that? Now, what is that? How can something a month away cause us to be sick today? You want the truth or you want to lie? I can lie to you and say, well, you know, nobody wants to see those harsh circumstances. That's pretty rough stuff. Nobody wants to see that, so that would upset just about anybody. No, it wouldn't. It depends on who you trust in for real. And this is where you have to really talk to yourself. Nobody else can help you in this but you. It's a choice you have to make. You've been trained to live your life modeled after what the fallen taught, not after what God taught. See, what the Lord taught, he augmented while they were in the desert, which was, trust me daily. Stop looking at tomorrow. See, Jesus said, take no thought of tomorrow. What you're going to eat, drink, wear, and all this other stuff for today holds enough trouble for itself. Take no thought of tomorrow. Be founded in today. Do what you can do today. So we should learn by the instruction of Christ how to be alive today. But most people are not alive today. So let me explain that. Here's what I mean. Because we get worried about things that happen far in the future. Today we're dead. What does that mean? Your focus and your responses are based on something that has not happened yet. It's far in the future. So what happens if I'm in a bad mood because my home is threatened next month, but I'm in a bad mood today. I won't talk to anybody. I'm not speaking on air. I'm not doing anything because I'm not going to have a home next month, right? Everything is threatened. And so I just totally shut down. Will that be faith? Will that be excusable? No, it wouldn't be. Let me tell you why. Because there is no future until it comes, number one. The future is all part of your imagination. Now, I'm going to attempt to break the confusion of something here tonight in a very short time. The future is part of your imagination. The only future that's not part of your imagination is what the one who is already in the future has stated about the future, which is God Almighty. Nobody else is in the future but him. He's already at the end of all this that has happened. You know what, if you could, think of your father in heaven in a very different way. Don't humanize him. Don't put him in a box. But hear what I'm saying. Right now, God exists at the beginning of time. Right now, God exists at this very moment. Right now, God exists at the end of all time. He's aware of all of it. He's in all time periods right now, but we are not. 
He already knows what's going to happen in the future. He speaks of present tense as though it was past tense a lot in the Bible. It would blow you away when you start picking this out. He already knows of the future, and he also already said that he finished everything. And he said he did this from the beginning, meaning the cycle was all complete. So what are we doing? It's almost like we're reliving the experience. The experience that led up to our victory or our ultimate internment. But he is alive in all. So we can't even conceive of it. How he is alive. We can't do that. The only thing we can do is humanize him, which we should not do, because he exists in your next moments. He's already worked with you 10 years from now, if you last that long. He's already worked with you tomorrow. He already ensured some things and moved some things out of the way for the next few minutes. He stands in the past. It's very clear to him. He knows when you look back in your past and you attempt to bring something from your past in your present, because he's back there in the past. Time does not exist to our Father. Existence is existence to him. Time is given to mankind that mankind may reflect upon what he did and learn. Time is because our minds are slower and we're limited by our biological form. And we've forgotten quite a bit. Why? Because we believe in lies rather than the truth. That's what our Father said. He said that in the beginning. He said that in the middle. He said that at the end. This is what we choose naturally of our flesh, but not of our born-again spirit. But we also suppress our born-again spirit through trusting everything in this realm of reality. Here we go. You don't believe that, do you? You may not believe that. Now, use the security in the future as an example because there are people grumpy today over something that has not happened yet. Do you think God approves of that? Do you think he understands that he would allow you to do it another 20 years because you did it 30 years in the past? Or do you think there ought to be a change? How many of you know that by yourself you can't make that change because you don't know how? In other words, how many of you could be taught never to worry again? By the way, worry, what is worry? Is not worry when you believe an image in your imagination that has not happened yet. So then, worry is actually believing the imagery of a lie, isn't it? Have you ever taken inventory of your own worries? I did one time, and every single last one was founded upon a lie. And I said, oh my Lord, I'm wasting my time being frightened, being, being worried over a lie, because none of it came true. You know, there was not a time when anything I ever worried about came true. I mean, really worried, none of it came true. And I said, I can't do this anymore. That's when I saw it. And I said, thank you, Lord. Let me make this change. Because he inspired me to take inventory of your worry. You know me, I was, what is that? Take inventory of your worry. In other words, start seeing the truth of your life. Stop just letting things go by. Listen, we live a rich experience. How many people take advantage of what the Lord has actually done? Listen to what he did. We live we have life right now. Our life is evidence of what's been real and what's been false in our own lives. Forget about everybody else. Never put your eyes on the evaluation of somebody else because believe me, you have enough work to do in your own life. But if you take today of where you are right now and you say, okay, Father, where am I with you? Well, I still worry. Then you have the answer. That's because I didn't take care of it. If you begin to take inventory and say, I worried about this and you make a list and then you see how many things came true, you're going to find a big zero. Well, that didn't come true. That didn't come true. And the things that did come true, you already knew they would happen. You were just slothful in taking care of them. That came from bad stewardship. So it's so funny. When you're a bad steward, the word is true for you. When you're a lazy, bad steward, of course you're going to have the outcome that's not favorable to you. But these other issues that we worry about that are far outside of our control, all of them end up being a lie. So we waste our time. Many of you know this. You've been worried about something sick for weeks. Then finally... You're so sick about it, so worried about it. You've lost weight behind it and everything else. I did this before. And then when it gets up to the moment, it's all different. It never comes out the way you think. And then when it's over, you say, Phew. and then you look back, you say, wait a minute. I wasted all that time on worrying when I should have been planning. Father, forgive me for not trusting you. And then it comes around again. And what do you do? You start that worry process again. I do the exact same thing. And then when it's over, you say, Phew. Because the outcome is nothing like what you feared. I'm not saying that the outcome is favorable to what you thought it would be either. But it changes you. Every single thing you go through has grown you. It didn't set you back. It grew you. It broke things from you. And you're going to see the Father in your entire history if you begin to do this. And when you finish, you'll say, forgive me, Father. I was so smart, I was stupid. I thought I knew it. And I've been operating, being guided by fear. And I'm believing lies. The very thing you said the deceived do, I was. That's what you'll say. All of us understand what it is to be rejected, to be shoved in the corner, to be forgotten. 
And because we knew what that is so well, guess what we have done? As we started growing, we built a defense mechanism. We built a defense mechanism to never feel pushed away again. Do you not know that most of what we do in life is so that we can be accepted by somebody else? But we're very careful in how we do that. See, we won't let everybody get close to us. We won't do that. We'll push certain people away because you don't have, you, you just don't have that type of security with all people. And if somebody seems mean and mad and everything else, it may cause you to be militant because you're not going to be pushed away. In fact, you have orchestrated your life so that you can partly win. No matter if you're poor, no matter if you're rich, you have orchestrated your life so that you can win. Why? So that you will not be a no one. Nobody likes to be a no one. That's a very bad feeling to be on the outside. And as you grew, you know what you said? I'm not going to be that person anymore. Nobody can do this to me anymore. Then you wouldn't have relationships and made that feeling even stronger. Nobody's going to just throw me away anymore. And you do things to avoid that. So in most cases, you do things in life to avoid being pushed away. Part of that protective barrier is so no one looks at you and laughs at you. When you're in your house and you're trying to make, you're trying to make it, you're trying to be somebody. Some people do this by way of income, what a lot of people do. And because they don't want to feel rejected. They want people to point at them and just automatically assume they know what they're doing so they are left alone, so they're not picked on or anything else. Which is why when a person's electricity is about to be cut off, it can be one of the most terrible things a person can go through. Now that sounds funny, doesn't it? But I truly understand that. I understand that if a person's electricity goes off, their phone doesn't work, their refrigerator doesn't work, and people are gonna look at them like something is wrong with them, like they couldn't keep up with the standard the world set. And that causes fright within a person, do you know that? It's not that the person is weak. It hits part of the protective mechanism that we had since we were children. Nobody wants to be the one everybody else is pointing at. Nobody wants to be the spectacle that everybody laughs at. We've been through that. And as a Christian, one of the reasons you came to Christ and you're in your soul, some of you are, are in the body of Christ so strong is because you found family. You found those who went through the same thing you did. And you look at these people and you say, you know what, you partly get it. But nobody else does. Because before meeting that family in Christ, all you could say about everybody else was, nobody gets it. I feel all alone in this world. You may have smiled, you may have had a big family and everybody else, but you know that nobody truly understood what you were going through. And then when you meet others in the body of Christ, and you find those stories that are so similar to yours, you feel at home. I say that's a good thing, because it starts to break the shell that we built around ourselves. We're still frightened to be ourselves. We are. Even I, the controversial person, I only go so far when it goes to a person's personality. I begin to get quiet because I know what a person can go through. I know that all of us are hiding on the inside behind a shell. But what has happened is this. In the Bible, there's a story that mirrors our lives. You guys have heard me give a hint to this on occasion. There's a story in the Bible that's about us and about the character we built around ourselves. How that we sold ourselves into slavery. How that we had become someone else. Someone that everybody could, you know, potentially deal with better than your true self. And your true self, you've locked away. But here's the issue. The person you locked away is the very one God sent here to this earth. He did not send what we are. He sent what we locked away. Isn't that funny? The very person that was hurt, that was, you know, didn't like to be picked on, that was picked on and everything else, that person we locked away. The person who was flighty, who believed all things, who believed that everybody could love one another. You know, those people like that, we believe that, right? We locked that person away. The person that was not so complicated, but loved the simplicity, the person that believed that all things were possible, we locked that person away. And we put a shell around ourselves. But God is coming back for the person we put away, not for the people we have become. Because the person we put away is powerful. That person is meant for the thousand year reign. Surely not the person we created unto ourselves. You know, to, to, to a large degree, we're still trying to present that person that we made ourselves. Remember yesterday I was talking about most things we do now is copied from somebody else. It's not original. Our dress is not original. What you, Your style is not original. Your tattoos are not original. Nothing about you is original. It's copied from somebody else what somebody else did. And it looks like everybody else. Funny thing in it. But that person we covered over that we won't expose to the world, that person is one of a kind. The shell we put around ourselves is educated by the world. We have an ability to easily become what we create. Do you know that? All humans have this ability. Kind of like the animals in the wild. See, a cat can be very cunning, but it can also be stealthy. It will become what it has to become to survive. Didn't you see that about the animal kingdom? Insects. They can become what they need to become to survive. I think that God has shown us that through a plethora, a, a variety of species. Matter just mind-blowing. 
like the praying mantis. Some look like flowers. Some look like tree bark. Some look like grass blades. I mean, perfect mimicry. They become what they become to survive. No more you think you must survive. No, you're not here to survive. Do you know why I say that? You're not an animal. This world is for you. The animals are created for you. We're not created for the animals and insects. The animals, the insects, the trees, the O2, the volcanoes, earthquakes, and all these processes are developed for us. Everything in creation exists for us. God made this planet and all that is in it for us. Don't be fooled. The fallen have twisted that message. You have dominion over this earth. Not you, not the person that you have made unto yourselves, but the person God sent here. That person we locked away. That person has dominion over the earth. That is the person the power resides in. The hidden person, the one that nobody can see. Here's the funny part. Do you know that was prophesied? That all God's children would do that. It was already prophesied. They would be hidden for a time, and they would be revealed when Jesus is revealed. That is the funniest thing, because it's almost like everybody did this, but Nobody had the ability to truly identify what they were doing subconsciously. By command of prophecy, you fulfilled it, you hid yourselves. Because you are to be revealed, it will surface. Normally what happens is, this person we created ourselves, we're the ones that will reject this person. We'll say no more. This person has no authorization near me. It's like a coat. One day you're going to take that coat off, and you're going to say, that's not me. This is me. That day is coming quickly. Now, there's a beginning process to this, though. There's a choice. And now that the days have come where things are being revealed, many things are being revealed, it's also the time that knowledge, true knowledge and knowledge of the living God, is starting to come forward in truth. Not this fake stuff. Not the traditional stuff that we do to satisfy the character we created here on earth, but the true walk that feeds the person we put away. How many of you are sensing that the person you put away so many years ago is becoming stronger? It's almost like you're hitting this point to where you're saying, I'm no longer afraid to be exactly what God made me to be. It's getting stronger. It's not like we orchestrated this. It's happening. It's happening in line with the prophecies, with Scripture. You're starting to shed things that you've carried for many years. You're starting to see them for what they are. All the flaws of your life are in the exterior shell that you present to everybody else. It is in the you that's trying to make it in this world the best they know how, but the Lord already said he would break us all free from this. That person you created in the outer shell is trained in the arts given by the fallen. That person of the outer shell can never be holy because it's not real. Can you see that? It's a face we put on before we interact with everybody else. It's kind of like makeup. Somebody puts on their blue contacts, their big puffy hair, their, their darkened makeup, the suntan, whatever it is, the fingernail polish, and, and when they go out in public, everything somebody sees is nothing what the person actually is. They're walking out there with blonde hair. They truly have red hair. They're walking out there dark skin. They're truly as white as snow. They put their lipstick on and double it for thick lips. They really have thin lips. It's just like everything is all just fake these days. People are hiding behind shells. And you know what's so bad? They don't know it, but you are to know it. So talks like these are good. So that we never lose ourselves in that character. Because listen, what will happen when the Lord comes back? You ready? When the Lord comes back, why do you think people are going to be condemned in the first place in truth? This is by biblical principle in truth. It's very simple. Why do you think people will be condemned? Because most of you have entertained the thought, wait a minute, if we have such a loving God, how can he condemn anybody? It's a very simple answer. You ready? Every single choice that we're making. We're either making a choice of righteousness or a choice to save ourselves. Think about that. Now, when you make these choices, you're becoming light or dark. So every day you're eating a light cookie or a dark cookie. You know the old statement, you are what you eat. So by the time Christ comes back, you will have eaten your fill of whatever it is, so that at that time you will either be light or darkness. Now, when Jesus comes, listen to this. This is how loving our Father is. The Father's not coming back to destroy people. The Father's coming back to destroy darkness, to destroy iniquity. Whoever has become one with iniquity will be destroyed with iniquity. And that's why the call went out long ago to come get away from iniquity. Get these purged these ways from you that they not be found in you. 
when he returns because when he returns iniquity cannot survive in his presence he's going to destroy darkness with the brightness of his coming it's not like he's coming back and saying, i'm going to get the devil i'm going to get this i'm going to get that no his very presence will destroy iniquity and so what he wants you to do is not become one with it so if i become one with iniquity if i do iniquitous things and accept iniquitous things all the days of my life then by the time he comes back i'm going to be so full of iniquity here's the process when iniquity is destroyed out of me there won't be any of me left you're in this world you're doing things you have choices to make every choice you make matters now if you made a thousand choices for iniquity and you begin to love iniquity you're becoming one with it so that when iniquity is destroyed out of you it will only be a speck of you left which cannot be saved there's not enough do you see what i'm saying now those who desire righteousness but hate iniquity and everything they do they're trying to become righteous and they choose that righteous path even when they cannot accomplish it now that's a biblical principle i'll say it again because satan can't stand this if you choose righteousness even if you're not able to accomplish it as far as you think that accomplishment goes you have eaten that righteousness so the righteousness in you grew and the iniquity shrunk and if you continue to do that when the Lord comes back, he'll destroy the iniquity out from you because all of us have a trace or pieces or components of iniquity. But you, the identity, the soul of you will still be intact, thus saved from the your own iniquity that's within you. See, when the Lord does come, he's going to save us from the darkness within ourselves. Stop looking externally. That's not where the trouble is coming from. The trouble is not coming from the left or to the right or from the back or from up down or to the front. The trouble is coming from the choices we truly make. Those choices that we choose to become a part of iniquity or good or righteousness. And then when we partake of it, it grows in us. And when the Lord comes back, we'll destroy all darkness. Now, if we have become more light than darkness, when he destroys the darkness, we will still survive. Thus, we have eternal life. See, that's why the rewards are different. Have you ever wondered about the rewards? How some people are rewarded more than others? How can that be if we serve a just God who does not do things by competition? It's because for some people, an entirety may be intact, and for others, only a little, while it's all salvageable. Do you see that? So with every true choice you make, see, that's why nobody can trick the Most High. I tell people all the time, they say, well, I think so-and-so is deceiving people. Well, let them keep going. Just make sure you don't do it. If we stand for righteousness, we need not call out the iniquitous part of anybody. The Lord does that. We need to pray for them. And if you can do more than pray, reach them. Don't ever push them away. Reach them. Somehow, if you can't reach them, pray for them and never forget to. Because when the Lord comes back, that's going to be a final thing. Whoever has become one with darkness is out of here. If your personality has become dark, you will be destroyed with the darkness. See, the Lord is not coming back purposely. Well, I'm going to get all, just all the people. No, he will make an end to the darkness itself. And if you're one with it, because your life, listen, your life is the evidence it is the proof where you are right now is strong evidence to who you really are. I'm not talking about where you are where people can see. I'm not talking about that. Because the truth of you is on the inside. A person can be full of iniquity, but look like they have just prospered spiritually so much. No one's going to fool God that way. See, the Lord knows when you love someone or when you're trying to get something out of someone. The Lord knows if you care for someone or if you're using them to further yourself. The Lord knows the truth about us. And based upon that, oh boy. See, when it says in the Bible that faith without works is dead, that was an encouragement for us to say, don't just simply have your heart in the right place, but begin to live behind the choices you make. See, that for us. Do you guys know how difficult it is sometimes to expose these small works of Lucifer and how he can trick and deceive people? Yet when you go back to the Word of God, you start seeing the simplicity of it. That's when I threw academia out. I threw academia out of my head. It does not work for the Bible. I, you know, I've tried that a thousand different ways. I was with the best of them. I talked to the best. It doesn't work. And if you're spiritually blind and all you have is academia, you're going to be a frustrated individual. If you're going to have faith 
in the Father on a daily basis, you certainly can't be what you have created unto yourselves. You know what the Bible calls that? Strange garments. Yes, this conversation is in the Word of God. And strange garments is the one who has created a character that God did not create. God is not familiar with strange garments because that's our creation and that's in the Bible. So guess what happens when you start getting rid of this surface character? You begin to depend upon the Lord daily. You'll find yourself free of a great many things because right now, listen, even you guys who are among your families, your families don't know parts of you that you still protect to this very day. You're okay sitting back and everything so long as they accept the character you have presented. Sometimes you want so badly to expose this character on the inside, but you don't trust anybody enough to do it. But have you noticed all the energy we had in creating these characters is dying and something else is taking place. Oh, I thank God for that. This talk is about recognition to get you to see something that is so embedded in our culture and life, period, that it's almost impossible to point out to anybody. But if you can see it, oh my goodness, you're blessed because that means you can know the rest of it. But now in this day and age, ladies and gentlemen, be aware of that shell. Now that you're mindful of the shell, get ready for a brand new... Uh, thing in life. See, the Lord normally does this. He will make us, cause us to see something. He'll open our eyes to a truth, a small truth. And then your life will begin to change based upon that new truth you learned. So get ready for more instruction, more breakthroughs. Your eyes are going to see more. You're going to notice more because all of us will be delivered. That is one of the key points. And Satan naturally is going to offer opposition. He does it. That's who he is. He believes in the shell he created for himself. Therefore, he does not know himself anymore. But we know who he really is. He does not. See, when God gives somebody over to a reprobate mind, I know you read in the Bible what it is that one time, but let me tell you, it's real simple. Here's a reprobate mind. It's when we believe in the person we created. That's what a reprobate mind is. That person you created that gets along in this world, that navigates this world, that is one with the world, that's what you become when you're given over to a reprobate mind. You think that you're really that person. Thus, the purity in you is totally lost. That's what a reprobate mind is. We built a defense to defend ourselves. God made all things in such a way that all of it complements the other and nothing is out of sync. When you begin to see that, certainly about this outer shell that you have created to yourself, for yourselves, you're going to begin to see Israel in a brand new light. In fact, you're going to see uh, Judah and Jerusalem as something you never saw before. You're going to see it in a way that makes absolute sense with everything. But you're not going to be able to communicate this when you want to. You're going to see it yourselves. It'll be a great blessing in your life, but it'll take God himself to give you the right words to explain it to somebody else. You'll begin to see it. You'll begin to comprehend and know the stories in the word of God, which by the way will increase your faith even more with the faith of the true creature he made you to be. The, the faith of that creature will be increased. The shell must come down because we have built the Jericho, haven't we? We have built one and the trumpets directed by the living God will be responsible for the downing of the walls we have built unto ourselves. You can see that revelation also. See how the Bible just ties in intimately together all over the place. You know, what we're finally starting to say, Lord, give us some spiritual food. Give us the truth, not the hype. We've had enough of the hype. We're burned out on sensationalism. We don't want the hype. We don't want empty promises either. We just want the simplicity of the truth that we may walk in it. We're back to asking for the exact things those who were sincere in the Old Testament and knew asked for. It's almost like a cycle. We have to go through this cycle, just like birth. Now remember, your Father in Heaven makes all things in cycles. We're in one, too. I don't know about you, but I plan on taking advantage of every single day of it. Because your mind of understanding opens up when that true hunger sets in. That's when the Lord provides. Just like in Egypt, listen to me. Your provision, He'll give you daily. I'm telling you something. If you are hungry for the Word today, He will feed you today. Do you understand? If you're hungry for the word today, he'll give you that manna from heaven. He already said he would, and that's what the manna is. The absolute truth, not the hype, not the sensationalist statements, not the pep rallies, not the feel-good things, none of those. But he will give you the real spiritual food because your provision is for today. That's every day of your life. Your provision is for today. Going back to the beginning of this conversation, many of us have security in those provisions for weeks ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, that used to work. Your provision is for today. And those who are hungry today, the Lord will not fail to feed you today. He's changing it. He's doing this. We're not doing it. He is. We're being witnesses 
of his truth, of this change, but he's doing it. He's doing it because things will become all-consuming. Now hear me on this, and then I have to go. These foundational small little living room talks are very important because all of what the fallen are doing, that's also going to manifest. It's going to become very real. You're going to learn things that are very distasteful. You will learn the truth about things and secrets that have been held. Of course, when they come up with the truth, you're not going to care who held it for so long. But they can frighten people. Many of you were the first called out of your families to believe in the Lord the way you do. Which means you have it first that you may comfort them. Those who you know may not be able to deal with what's coming forward. Many will have heart attacks from what they're seeing with their eyes. And I guarantee you, people don't have heart attacks over war. But they do have heart attacks over things much greater and more threatening than what they could ever have imagined. These are very sober times. They will seem surreal to the foolish only. And as we build the foundation in truth and things come forward in truth, you'll be the ones that will be able to function. You'll be the ones instructed to go to others. You'll be the voice of reason around so many who will be afraid. See, because those who become who become the Lord's now, the Lord will give them sight to see what not only what is before them, but he'll allow them to see the truth of everything.